the library foundation. Well, thank you. So, as I, as I was telling various people, I pretend to be an intellectual, I'm actually an emotion junkie. And I, I, I adore this. I adore the feeling that he has for this place and his articulation and his sense of dignity and the sense of the worth of this place and the, I think the love that he has for it. It's contagious. And I think that the language that we heard was a miracle. That language had not been spoken for 75 years and Vincent picked it up from wax cylinder recordings that, he's, that a couple of people had left behind in the 1930s. Leanne Hinton is here, and Leanne is a linguist at Cal, and she's, and she's been active in, in this Master Apprentice program of getting California Indian languages that are down to their last speakers are extinct and getting them revived. How, how, how long have you been at it, Leanne? Well, let's see, the advocate for Indigenous California language survival is 25 years old. So 25 years ago, Leanne and I worked on this map of California showing how many speakers were left in these various languages. And, and some of them were down to three speakers, some of them were down to one speaker. Various places had zero speakers. Today, various of these places that have zero speakers now have several. And Louis Trevino is here. He's Vincent's partner and he's Ramazina Ohlone. And the Ramazina Ohlone are from the Monterey Bay Area. When Kroeber wrote his handbook of California Indians, was it 1923? 1925. A hundred years ago, he said that the Ramazina were culturally extinct. He said that about us too. <laughs> <laughs> so, we're, we're, so we're here among extinct people. And to hear this language spoken, to hear, see these customs, is so beautiful and so touching. And I'm so grateful for your generosity in bringing it up. I think that, so I, I've been hanging around the dealers now for 40 years, and I think one of the main just things I've learned is how to be generous. In terms of this language, I want to start talking about language that was talked about food. So with language, you brought it back, but the thing that interested me was you made it current. You didn't just speak the old way. You, you have words for computers, you have words for telephones, and you, you brought up the date so you could speak it. Well, one of the things, uh, when I first started working with, uh, with our language, because, as I said previously, I didn't grow up speaking it. I, I in fact, didn't, didn't know any of the words of my language growing up uh, because of the aspects of colonization. This is of no fault of our own, but in the 1930s, that's when our last uh, first language speakers of Chochenyo passed away. And they were recorded by this linguist named John Harrington over in the Pleasanton and Sonora Rancheria. That's the same place that my great-grandma was born. And my great grandma, she really represents that generation that was um, that really transitioned a lot of our culture to um, and made sure that a lot of our culture was documented and recorded, so that when it was safer, it would be it would be possible for us to pick it back up and reconnect with these things. And this is directly connected to our history. Um, there was bounties on the heads of, of Indian people. It was legal to kill us, and there was indentured servitude. People were slaves. There was all of this pain, and I don't want to go too much into that because I don't like to think all that much about that, but it's important for you to understand that there's institutional reasons um, that were in place that, that caused our language for about 70 years to stop being spoken. But the thing is, it never, it never went away. None of this ever went away. It was preserved, and as, um, as one of my, my heroes who's back here, Leanne Hinton, uh, has often said, our language, our languages across California are, are sleeping. And with the right efforts, they can be nudged, and they can, become a, they can become awake again. And they can just be part of our lives again. And I would often, when I was a kid, 
I would see my family, because we're the same people as those old people from back then, we're just in a different time. We're Ohlone people of today, and when I was a child, I would see the, my family, especially the, the older ladies in my family, when they, would, uh, when they would cook, and they were in the kitchen, I would always see the way that when they would start gossiping, how their voices would kind of become a little more hushed, and how they kind of took on this different tone to how they would talk, and sometimes things would go really rapid, and sometimes things would go really slow. And I just loved that kitchen conversation, that kitchen voice. It was always around me, because I have a big family. We, uh, we love to eat. <laughs> and so we would always, uh, I would always hear this when I was a kid. But I wondered, what would that sound like in Chochenyo, in our language. I didn't even know it was called Chochenyo when I was a kid. I just knew that it was uh, an Ohlone language that our ancestors spoke. But I wondered, what did that sound like? Not grand speeches or anything like that, but just everyday, everyday conversation. And I remember I asked some people in my family, and especially my grandma, she said, why don't you go learn and find out? And so that's what I started to do was, um, I started to slowly, little by little, learn those old words by doing a lot of research and by digging into old archives and then by working with the archives at UC Berkeley made possible through, um, through a program that Leanne and the Advocates started called uh, Breath of Life, the Advocates for Indigenous California Language Survival. And now I'm a board member of that organization. And, I, uh, and in about seven years of doing this work, I've, uh, I've, become, I've become conversationally fluent in the language. And, and that's something that I have a lot of pride in because I use it every day at home. And I teach it to my family. And my family now, they're at a stage where they're teaching it to the younger people in our family. Where children now are just growing up speaking these words like if they were never gone at all. And that really taught me something about what's possible with dedication and hard work, humility, and a lot of respect and patience, that those things that we didn't have before can be brought back relatively quickly because we know that these things are meant to be still here with us, that they're not meant to be held in archives, that they're not meant to be, to be in a university, but they're meant to be in our mouths, in our homes. They're meant to be when we're cooking, when we're playing, when we're when we're together as a community. And that also taught me something else, is that if language can be brought back that quickly by our community, then other aspects of our culture as well can be brought back too. And one of the things that I, um, that I also wanted to see was when I was growing up, I would see all of my friends, uh, they would go to, to restaurants, and they would go to restaurants that were associated with their ethnicity. I grew up with a lot, of, uh, a lot of Filipino people, a lot of Greek people around me. And they would always have such good food when they would go to these restaurants. And, and they would bring it back and they would say, oh, this is from my culture. This is from where I come from. And I never really had that because we didn't know, we didn't have our old foods practiced and eaten at home. The closest that we came to it was old foods that were passed down to me from my great-grandma were foods from the rancheria. Old Spanish foods, deep chilies, moles, good things like that. Foods that, that were passed down from the rancheria that came from the mission. But I, I also knew that those foods weren't traditional specifically for us. But there's a place for them, because that's also a part of our history as well. And when I would eat those foods, I always associated those old foods with Indian foods too. But then when I started to dig deeper, I realized that those aren't the traditional foods for our people. Our food is deer and acorn, salmon and chia, bitter greens and mushrooms, bay laurel and yerba buena, all foods that still grow in this place. And slowly, with Lewis, we started to, to go through those old archives where our language is stored. Because those old archives, there's thousands and thousands of pages, too many pages to even count, I think. But in those old archives are, are old timers who recorded this information to this linguist in Harrington. They were also, they had their agenda as well. 
and their agenda was to preserve every other aspect of our culture in those notes that they could. So they told about our stories that stretch back to creation. They told about how our regalia looked like and what our dances were like in those old days in the roundhouse. They talked about the injustice that our community faced when, as they put it in their own words, when the whites came and ran us off of our land. They told us about their hopes for the future. They told us about their dreams for what's to come for us. And they also talked a whole lot about food, <laughs> about how good our food is, about how they preferred our foods when other foods were given to them, how there were restrictions against foods, how we had dietary laws, against how foods were meant to be cherished and celebrated, about how foods were not meant to be just overgathered, but how you're supposed to give thanks to things when you're taking them, when you're gathering them. All of these things are connected to our values, which are all embedded in those old notes. So in so many ways, language is a part of the food that we're eating, and the food is a part of the language that we're speaking. It's all interconnected. And so that's how I got started with language and with food as well. So it means a lot to me that you're able to, to try some of these because these are the oldest flavors of this place. This is true California food. <laughs> and before there was any other food that was here, this is the first. So this is talking about the loss of knowledge and the loss of culture. When I first got into this, what I was stunned by was how much we knew. And it wasn't the technologies of things. It wasn't the, the language had gone, a lot of the technologies had gone, a lot of the stories had gone. What we mean was the habits. And the way families, he talks about coming from a large family, these families were still intact, are still intact. And you, you go there, the younger people are relating to the older people in ways that are ancient. And the sense of the land, the sense of who you are, what a human being is, the sense of the sense of dignity, there's something in that old ferocity that I still see, that sense of witchcraft that was there, and that sense of the magic of the world, the sense that you're living in a living world, and that's all still there. I'm going to tell a story about Dario. So, years ago, it was around 1974, I went down to meet this old Ohlone guy named Phil Galvin, who was, I think, your cousin. And he was, oh, he, he was over at Mission San Jose in Fremont, and he was a religious Catholic. And one of the ironies of this world is that the, many of the Ohlone's that retained the best, the best memories of their culture were at the missions. Because the ones that they, 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 they went to the dominant society, there was no place you could be an Indian. In the mission, you could be an Indian. And it was degraded, but you still could be an Indian. And, he, and Phil worked as a caretaker for this. This is a convent down there. So the Sisters of Perpetual Misery, or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I, forget, I forget what they were called. But he worked there as a caretaker, and, he, and, and everybody loved Phil. So I went down to visit him, and there was this older guy named Dario. How is Dario related to Phil? Um, so we come from the Marine family, and the Marine family has ten siblings. I come from Victoria Marine. Dario Marine is Victoria Marine's uh, brother, and then Phil comes from Dolores Marine. And Phil is Dolores Marine's son. Okay. It, Joe Marine and those guys are... their cousins. The cousins. So Dario was talking about how in the during the, the, the depression, he would go out to the he would go to Maui Slough to hunt sea lions. And, and what he was proud of was his ability to rope them up and haul them through the sloughs and bring them back to his house in Fremont. And he was, he was proud of his rope tying techniques. Because roping up a seal or a sea lion is kind of difficult. But he would rope it up and, and every day he was afraid of fishing game, he was afraid of the police. So every day he would find a new way of going through the marshes and he's trying to stay in the marshes as long as he can. One day he was down in the marshes, and it, it, it seemed as if that sea lion slipped into a groove, and he now, it just went so easily up to, up to his house. He realized that he found that groove 
where his ancestors have been hauling sea lions for thousands of years. There's something about this cultural, this cultural revival that I feel once the, when the language comes back, other things come back. And you find that old groove and, and, and other cultural things come with it. And I think that this whole business of cultural revival is so stunning to me. And what comes back are some of these attitudes and some of these ways of being. I think I now hear people giving these boring speeches the way they did in the old days. These pompous, boring speeches that the chiefs used to give. At the same time, there's all of this tenderness that comes out, there's all this knowledge, the humor is coming back. And I think when you have something like language, it's just the tip of the iceberg and food. But this food is not... So you're not cooking this food a traditional way. Some of it we do, and some of it we have to make accessible for our people. Now, uh, before uh, I talk about the ways that we, uh, we make these foods accessible, I'd like to start just by saying that uh, what Lewis and I started was an organization, is an organization, called Mak Amham, which in Chochenyo it means our food. And we're calling it Mak Amham because we want this food to be something that directly goes back to our communities first. That way that our communities are empowered with these old foods. And then in the process we're able to slowly, along with other aspects of the cultural revival, strip away the layers of colonization that were imposed on us to return to something that's true, to return to something that's real. Now, the reason why these foods are, are important to our community, it's, it, we know that our body types are the same body types as those people from before. We might be in a different time, but the foods that were bad for us back then, disastrous for us, in fact, that were imposed on us, wheat flour, refined sugars, corn, things like that, that were imposed during the mission in the early American periods and sometimes become generationally passed down because people um, have those foods imposed on them and, there's, and the old foods become sometimes forgotten. And so we wanted this to be something that empowers our people for both our health and also for cultural revival and the reawakening. Now by reconnecting with these old foods, these are the foods that we know our bodies recognize. We know that these are the foods that our ancestors cherished and that were good for their bodies. And if they were good for their bodies, knowing that we have those same bodies, they're good for our bodies too. And one of the things that, that's happened is we can't go and gather exactly in that old way that our, our people before did. Whenever I do, I'm, I'm always up in the parks, but I always have to keep an eye on my back, like if I'm a criminal or something, because because there are restrictions, real restrictions, within our own place about what we're able to do. So one of the things that we've had to do is find ways to make these accessible, ways that people can eat them every day, ways that they're not just novelties that people have here and there. It's okay. Mic drop. Uh, <laughs> but they're foods that we want people to have on their tables as much as possible. And so what this means is we have to find, we have to be innovative with this. And so some of the things that you're trying, they're all flavors that our people from before would recognize. They're colors, they're textures that our people from before would recognize. But there's also ways that our culture as well can, can be able to adapt new things without sacrificing those old values. One of the things I like to think about a lot when I think about the revival is what would happen if the invasion never occurred. What would happen if our homeland never became occupied? What would that look like if our culture was able to take on new forms organically and just to be able to take on new things on its own? Now we know that whatever would happen, at some point our people would somehow see the outside world, the world outside of California. And we know that those new technologies, many of them, might be embraced. I mean, why not, right? I love my, my iPhone, I love texting, I love Twitter. But, but if those things were embraced, what would that look like on our values, with our standards? So what I'd like to think about is knowing what our value system is, knowing what those old standards that our people have, which are great and vast, 
what would this look like if Ohlone food, if Ohlone identity, if Ohlone language, if it was just able to continue and adapt things on its own? What I like to think is it might look something like what we're looking like today. <laughs> as modern people who are embracing the things that we want to, and I mean by us, meaning in our communities, not, you know, not having to deal with a lot of the oppression that we deal with and a lot of the unfairness that we deal with, but, but within our home, we're modern people. We embrace things from the modern world, but we're rooted in those old, old, old things that matter to us. And I like to think that the food that you're eating is food that would make our ancestors proud food that they would see that embraces some things that might be a little bit different, but it's rooted in what's true and rooted in what's ours. And I think that those are ways that I, I really try to, to bring things back while still being able to, to make them things that, that people today can enjoy. So what I, what I, what I wonder about is, if it's, when the, when the Europeans first came here, the first act of colonization was to rename everything on the land. They renamed it back to the, next to the Spanish Saints. They, they renamed it after people of their own ilk. They named it after, after words in Spanish. And they, 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 they took the name of the land. And it was part of a, of a long process of erasure. And I think that one of the worst things that's happened to California Indians is not the racism, not the oppression, it's, it's been rendered invisible. And I think to be rendered invisible is, we, we, we would, if you have people that are oppressing you, at least they acknowledge your existence. When, you, when you're rendered invisible, they don't even acknowledge your existence. I keep wondering what would have happened when they came here if instead of this conquest, it had been a merger of cultures. We have so much to learn from California Indians, and I think California Indians had a lot to learn from the Europeans. I, 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 I hate to say it, but I think it's true. I could agree to differ. <laughs> but I, I, I think that what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm seeing you doing here is there's something traditional what you're doing, but there's something so damn modern about it all. You're using these gourmet techniques, you're using these European flavors. The, you, you, it's the old world in a modern way. And I, I, I've been comparing it to the time when the horse came to the plains, and the plains Indians adopted the horse, and it, ch it changed their culture, because they could now have, but it was the same culture, but they now do things that they've never done. I think with these foods, you can now, you, you, you can take this culture into the, into the future. And think, so it, 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 it's not a nostalgia for the past, it's, it's the future. One of the things that I like to think about a lot is what would this place look like if, uh, if again, back on what, we're, what I was just saying, if, if it was all on our terms and if all of those uh, values that we have uh, were visible everywhere that you go here in the East Bay. And what I like to think about, because I grew up in this place and uh, a few years ago, Malcolm and I, because we used to work together at Heyday, now we're, now we're good friends, and <laughs> but... Uh, but when we were at Heyday, we had this, uh, what would you call it, like a meditation exercise or something like that. Like when we had all these different native people come to, uh, to Heyday and we were able to, uh, to talk about our vision for what we see the Bay Area with native presence. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I, I love big parties. So I, I, I have people come over and we have discussions. And I think the discussion you're talking about is what would the future look like? Yes. Yeah. And one of the things that I that I imagined when I when I was in this uh, during this this conversation we were having, Malcolm made us do some uh, weird Berkeley thing where we had to meditate and close our eyes, and he said, "Imagine you're on your your um, imagine you're on the peak of your favorite mountain, wherever it is." You're on that peak, and just imagine that you're there. So we, you know, we're all closing our eyes and imagining that we're at this mountain. And then he told us to go down from that mountain and to imagine what we see when we're going down. 
And many people who were there, rightfully so, this isn't anything wrong, many people saw a traditional world where there were tuli boats and there were tuli houses and there was um, all of those beautiful old traditions that we know um, our, our older people cherished, that we still care about even to this day. But when I was going down from that imaginary mountain, I remember uh, seeing something or imagining something that was no different from the Bay Area that I see today. An urban place that had a lot of buildings and a lot of life and a lot of bustle, because this is where I grew up, this is all I really know. But in that bustle, it was driven by Ohlone people. So instead of seeing churches and temples in the hills, you saw roundhouses. Instead of driving on the freeway and seeing the signs of Hayward and San Francisco and Stockton and Oakland, you saw Huchulun and Ramlaitka and, and you saw Hokkien. You saw our old names emblazoned on those places. You saw cafes where acorn soup was sold and people speaking Chochenyo on the streets as the main language that was spoken. And when I saw that, it, when I was imagining that, that's the reality that I feel I envisioned in this area, is the Bay Area that I see, that I grew up in, but with a heavy dose of Ohlone reality. And this is, I think, in a lot of ways, what our food is kind of like, you know? It's, it's food that might be recognizable to some people, but it's also food that's rooted in what's ours and what's true to this place. And these are ways, I think, that we're able to keep things alive and strong. You know, we can't go back you know, 240 years and take away all these buildings right away, you know? And, you know, just yet. But, but imagining what this place would look like, driven by Ohlone people, I think this is a vision that's worthy of being promoted, that's, that's worthy of being fought for. So one of, the, one of the things I'm planning to do this spring is get together a conference on what people can, what, what done in culture can learn from Indians. And what they can learn, not just about environment, but about how to be human, about how to live in families, about property laws, about ownership of things, about governance, about all the various aspects of being alive. And I don't think it was a utopian society, but I think it had so, so much we could learn from them. How, how do you punish people when they, there are no prisons? How, 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 how. So, Indian pedagogy, how do you educate your kids? And the ways of educating kids were so ingenious and so wonderful and so well thought out. And I think there are things in there that we, we have so much to learn. And I, I, I think the time is the right to do it. Because I think right now we're in a position of cultural doubt. We have, America's falling apart. And we have... And we, our, our institutions are collapsing, and I think in this period of cultural doubt, people turn to Indians, and they turn to other people to, I think there's, a, there's an openness now that I'm saying. So I, I think it's a good time to learn stuff. So, 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 where, so where are you getting these ingredients from? <laughs> A lot of it is, uh, some of it's from Berkeley Bowl, <laughs> and a lot of it is gathered in that old way. It's a hybrid of things, just like how, uh, in a lot of ways, how, how uh, when you, what you see back there, some of it is from the bowl, and, and, and there's no shame in that. We have to find ways to make these foods accessible. But one of the things that we, that we do is we, um, is we do gather. We gather a whole lot. And we all, we, we all often uh, work with other Native folks as well who, uh, who keep their food traditions alive. And, and uh, we do a lot of trading with them too. So it's nice as well to bring back these old trade networks too. I'll tell you a, a little story. So um, there's, a, there's an Indian community not too far from here, about a uh, hundred miles east, um, the Tuolumne Rancheria. And the Tuolumne Rancheria, they're Miwok speakers, they're Miwok people, and they're a thriving community to this day. They're, they're really good friends of, of me, Louis, Malcolm, Leanne, Lena. And these, um, these people, we know that in the past, 
because it was remem it's still remembered by people living today, that at the turn of the century, they would come to the Pleasanton Rancheria, and they would dance in our roundhouse. We would dance together in that place and have ceremony. People would stay there for a long time in the Pleasanton Rancheria, and then afterwards, they would make a trip together to Santa Cruz. They would gather. They would gather abalone, shellfish. Some of the abalone would be gathered to make uh, jewelry. Some of, the, um, some of the other things would be used to smoke and to eat, like the smoked mussels and clams. Then they would go back home, and it would all happen again another year. Now, one of the things that's happened is our family, our family has, has disconnected for uh, about a generation or two with Tuolumne. And now, renewing these old traits, renewing our connections over language, renewing our connections by dancing in their roundhouse, renewing the connections by understanding our shared histories, it's reopened that old connection as well with them. And so, recently, uh, one of the people from Tuolumne Rancheria, she uh, emailed Lewis and myself, and she said, can you send me some of your recipes, some of these things that you make? And when she asked that, I, my immediate response was, of course, all of this is, this is yours as well, as much as it's ours, and we're trying to make this accessible to you, too. So we, uh, we did. And one of the amazing things, like what Malcolm's talking about, is how language, how it does open up much more, those connections with food, connecting to Tuolumne Rancheria, that's possible because of that foundation that's rooted in language, and that foundation that was rooted in reawakening something that was, that was sleeping for two generations, and understanding this identity, and then understanding all of the nuance that comes with that as well. It's, just, it's a really miraculous thing to see come back. And it's not just the Tuolumne people, it's Pomo people, it's Maidu people, people that we know that we historically connected with. And yet again, we're doing it. In 2017. So, so when are you going to serve grasshoppers? I'm not there yet. But <laughs> so but, it's, it's in California they are. That's a different delicacy. That's <laughs> <laughs> we uh, we definitely ate grasshopper. We know that grasshopper is one of our traditional foods. Um, even my great grandmother's generation, uh, they they had grasshoppers in their lives. But uh, we're inching back into something slowly. But but it will happen. The Chia Cafe is really good. Well, Chia Cafe has their own way of doing things. <laughs> no, we, we will. You'll have grasshopper on our menu one day, Mel. White meat or dark meat? <laughs> dark meat. Okay. Yeah. So, what, so you, you, you're, you're, you're still a young man. You've revived the language. You've you revived the food customs. What's coming next? Well, like what I said when I, when I was introducing myself, is this is one aspect of, of what we hope for uh, the larger cultural revival. Um, right now, we, we're working to have, as I said, everything back. You know, we want, we want our entire, our entire uh, cultural practices to be back and active in our world again. And one of the things that happened that gave me a lot of hope into how possible this is, is uh, last summer in August, I, I spent uh, with other people in my family about six months working to translate some of these old stories that were embedded in our, in our ethnographic notes. Stories like our foods that weren't accessible to us for a long time. Now these stories are, are incredible, they're powerful, and, and they stretch back to the ancient. And they're